and we are live. Okay, on this chapter, we're going to try to understand about a third type of market structure that exists, and that's monopolistic competition. So what I'm going to do for the next uh, 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a review of everything we have learned up to today, and then we jump into this chapter, trying to understand uh, monopolistic competition, okay? So let me go right here, and let me go right here. Okay, so this is what we're going to be learning. Well, let, let's go ahead and start from the beginning. As you already know, there are different types of market structures. You know, I think this is how the book divide them. We have perfect competition. We have monopolistic competition. We have oligopolies. The book mentioned duopolies and then monopolies. We have learned about monopolies and we have learned about oligopolies. Uh, we don't have to worry about duopolies because a duopoly is nothing more than a, an oligopoly or a monopoly, period, right? And we have learned about perfect competition, and today we're going to learn the last market structure, and that's monopolistic competition. So let me have a, a small review about the things that we have learned. Let's begin with uh, perfect competition. What is the thing that we know about perfect comp competition? It's a market structure that is made of Many firms. Many firms. What else? They're all small. All of them offer what type of product? The same. The same identical product. Uh, these companies have no control over the market and they become price takers. So then the only decision left for perfect competition is how many units we're going to produce. And how do they decide how many units they're going to produce? Remember, on perfect competition, the industry, supply and demand, creates equilibrium price. This company has no choice. They have to sell the product at whatever the industry determines. So then the only decision left for perfect competition is where they're going to produce and they use a strategy of the marginal revenue, marginal cost, which simply means the company produces where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Let's say they'll produce 100 units and they will charge a price that the industry determined. If it's $5, they have no choice. They have to sell it for $5. What else do we know about these companies? Okay, let me see right here. Is this company making money or losing money? making money yeah this company is making money because the average total cost is actually lower than the selling price but what do we know about about this situation what's going to happen they're going to continue producing in the short run but eventually they'll reach normal profit okay why sir because of the many firms that entry as the price gets lower exactly because profits is going to attract competition supply will increase that put pressure on prices to decrease. So now the new price become four, and now this company, marginal revenue, right, becomes four. And as you can see, this company is gonna produce using the same formula, for marginal cost equals marginal revenue, which simply means now they're gonna have to cut their output to 90, and now this company is making 90 units, but this company is no longer making a profit because the selling price equals to the marginal revenue. So then perfect competition, can only make profits on the short run, right? On the long run, perfect competition, right, will always make only a normal profit, right? Which is equal to what? Zero economic profit. So that's what we know about perfect competition, okay? So we have learned everything about perfect competition. Now let's go with monopolies. What do we know about monopolies? It's a market structure in which one company controls the industry, Right? This is the demand. This is the marginal revenue. And oligopolies use the same structure, the same approach that perfect competitions do. They stop producing for marginal cost equals marginal revenue. And because they are a monopoly, they are the only producers, they will try to charge as much as you are willing to pay. So a monopoly will always charge you a price as high as you want to pay. So let's say they will charge you $20. They produce 100 units. 
And now the question is, is this company making money or losing money on this graph right here? Making money. Making money because the average total cost is actually lower than the selling price. For how long is a monopoly going to be able to sustain these profits? Indefinitely. Okay, it is possible. Right? It is possible that a monopoly will be able to sustain profits for the long run as long as the demand is favorable. As long as the demand is favorable. Uh, what else do we know about all, uh, monopolies? Uh, monopolies is an imperfect market structure. They don't care about the success demand. They only produce what they think is going to give them the greatest profits. So there's always more demand but they are not going to create that demand because they don't care about what you want, they care more about the profits. So that's monopolies, okay? So we learn about monopolies. So today we, in, I'm sorry, that's what we learned, uh, two, uh, I think uh, about uh, three days ago. And then the next market structure is oligopolies. And what do we learn about oligopolies? Oligopolies have a downward slope in the bank curve, just like monopolies. Marginal revenue also separate. With oligopolies have a problem in which they do not follow a specific formula. There's no formula to determine the best level of output of what price to charge. Why? Why? Why is this no? The, Why? the emphasis is on countering the competition and reacting. Okay, and what do we call that phenomenon? The issue of oligopolistic interdependence that the decisions of one company is always going to create counter reactions by another company. So then we don't know what the company is going to do. Are they going to try to kill each other? Or are they going to try to cooperate? So it's a choice between companies, right? In the United States, it is illegal for companies to cooperate. So then what American companies do, they create informal cartels, right? It's an informal, you know what a cartel is? A cartel is an organization of companies that unite together to try to act like one company. They coordinate output, they coordinate prices, they coordinate everything. That's a cartel. In the United States, you cannot do, you cannot do that, so then what companies do, they create informal cartels. In other words, they act like our cartels without having to sign any documents. And how do they do that? Well, they can either do by one company becomes the price leader, Right. Everybody follow the company. Another way they can do it is by companies, uh, more or less, uh, geographically speaking, they separate the markets between themselves. Right? What, is, what are all the methods they, they coordinate their activities? I think there was a list. That's what we discussed yesterday. What's, what's all the methods? Uh, price fixing? Yeah, price fixing. Uh, that's, that's the illegal one. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, that's illegal. That's when you get together and try to what? To fix the price and everybody's going to charge the same price. So price fixing is illegal. Uh, price leadership is not illegal, but it's also a way of monopolizing the market. And uh, geographic- uh, Market uh, splitting. Idea. What was that, sir? Uh, the slide called it market splitting. Yeah, market splitting. In other words, they, they split the market between themselves. You take the West, I take the South, you take Tennessee, I take Kentucky, right? Again. Uh, that is illegal if they do it, you know, sitting down, you know, but the way they do it, these companies more or less get signals from the other companies and they behave. And then, and then what, what, what they're actually doing, guys, so you really think about it, then these oligopolies are creating mini monopolies in geographical areas. Like you are the only supplier of this product in California and the other company that is operating in Arizona is never going to go and compete against you. So then the companies create a small geographical monopolies. Because remember, to be a monopoly, you don't have to be a giant, right? To be a monopoly, you only have to be the only one. I mean, think about, for example, here in Cleveland. If you're in Cleveland, if I want to, let's say, if I want to uh, put a, a pool in Cleveland, there's only one pool company here in town. There's only one company that actually comes and builds pools at your houses. So then that little company, mm, they have a monopoly of pool constructions in Cleveland. One of the advantages that people in Cleveland have is that they can actually go to Athens or they can go to Chattanooga and probably get a company from over there and the company will be willing to move within 50 miles from wherever they operate. 
but there are some cities in which there's nobody close to. Think about, for example, if you're operating somewhere in Idaho or in North Dakota or in South Dakota, in which the closest city to a big city is 200 miles. So then in that city, we have one company that produces something that is essential for those people, so they have a monopoly. Okay, so that's oligopolies, okay? So now we're going to try to understand the last market structure, and now we're going to try to understand monopolistic competition. What is a monopolistic competition? How do they behave? How do they act? Do they make profits? Is it good for us? Is it good for the economy? Right? And those are the things that we're going to try to understand, okay? So let me share my screen, and we begin with monopolistic competition, okay? So we have this. Monopolistic competition, okay? Uh, what is unique about monopolistic competition? Okay, let me go right here. Monopolistic competition is a market in which many companies produce similar products or services, where each of them has some independent control of their own price. So there's a lot of little companies. They offer very similar products, but they have a little bit of control and make, they make decisions without consulting the other players. The best example of monopolistic competition will be the restaurant industry. Bakeries, retail stores. But the best example that I can think is restaurants. How many restaurants do we have? I mean, mention a city. I mean, I always make the joke, you know, how many Mexican restaurants do we have in Cleveland? Right? And the last time we counted, they were close to 22. 22 Mexican restaurants here in town. Why do you believe we have so many Mexican restaurants in town? Because it's an industry in which there's no barriers to entry. It's an industry that is unregulated. It's an industry in which anybody can come. It's an industry in which there's a lot of information. So then monopolistic competition is an industry made of small companies that they all offer the same product, but they try to give you different versions of the product. In other words, a chile relleno at a Mexican store is a chile relleno, period. I don't care where you buy it. An enchilada is an enchilada. A hamburger is a burger. I don't care where you buy it. It's still a burger, right? But if you buy a burger from Burger King, and you buy a burger from McDonald's, or you buy a burger from Wendy's, they all have a little bit of a small differences enough to justify whatever price the company wants to charge. See, what a Burger King say, my burgers are not grilled, but they are plain broil. What does Wendy say? Our burgers are made with fresh meat, never frozen, besides our patties are square, right? What does McDonald's say? You know, our burgers are cheap, right? I mean, that's about the only marketing strategy they have. Our burgers are inexpensive. You know, you can get a double cheeseburger for 99 cents. Okay, so again, there are different strategies. And if Burger King wants to introduce a new ribeye steak or a new whatever the case they do, the other companies don't care. So then, as you can see, then the companies make their own independent decisions. Think about coffee places. You know, look at Starbucks in every city. It's a Starbucks, but besides Starbucks, we have 10, 15 other little coffee places, and all of them you know, try to appeal to different markets. So that's monopolistic competition, okay? We're trying to understand how do they behave and how do they work, okay? So then monopolistic competition is a market with many companies. All of them have a similar product. There's no concentration ratios on monopolistic competition. They are no concentration ratios. In other words, all of them are so small, all of them are so small in relation to the industry that they have no control over the market. See, and that creates some problems because think about this. What will happen in a city in which we have, for example, 10 dining places, you know, places where you can go eat, 10 restaurants, and one of them decide to increase the price dramatically? Well, if you increase the price dramatically, good luck. You're gonna lose the customers because there's a lot of substitutes. I don't go, I don't have to go to your expensive restaurants. I mean, for example, here in town, you know, here in town, can you think of any, I mean, I know that you're not in Cleveland. Well, one of you is in Cleveland. 
uh, but think about uh, if here in Cleveland, uh, how many fancy restaurants can you mention here in town? Do you know of any fancy restaurants? Uh, Aubrey's. Aubrey's, is it really fancy? Well, I guess compared to what we have in Cleveland, you know, I mean, it's okay. But if you really think about it, Aubrey's in Knoxville is just what? Just another restaurant. There's nothing special about Aubrey's. You know, you go to Knoxville and you have hundreds of restaurants better than Aubrey's. But here, Aubrey's is what? A little bit specialized. The people that go there is a little bit, you know, a little bit higher income. Uh, you have heard about the Ball Headed Bistro. Anybody know about the Ball Headed Bistro here in town? The Ball Headed Bistro is a restaurant here in town, right? That is actually very expensive. You know, very expensive. I mean, you go out with your date there. I went with my wife, you go eat. And you end, you will easily, easily, easily walk out of the restaurant spending $100 without including the drinks, right? So it's a very fancy restaurant owned by Alan Jones, you know, one of the wealthiest guys here in town that owns Steak Into Check. It's the, uh, yeah, Check Into Cash, I believe. Yeah, and he opened that little restaurant. It's mostly for him, I guess, you know? And you know, a couple of wealthy people go there on Fridays, things like that. But as you can see, that's very exclusive. So if the ball headed bistro decide to introduce a new steak for $45, chances are that average individuals like me are not going to go over there because we have 25 other restaurants. Okay, so again, what I'm trying to tell you is that on this industry, monopolistic comp competition, there's no concentration ratios. You don't control the market, right? You make your decisions on your own, right? An example of monopolistic competition is most retail centers. Think about, for example, McDonald's. Who's the competition for McDonald's? It's not only Wendy's, right? It's not only, you know, uh, Steak and Shake. The competition for McDonald's is any fast food place. Do McDonald's compete against Mexican restaurants? Of course they do. You know, if I want to spend six bucks, you say, hmm, should I go to McDonald's and get me some burgers and fries? Or should I go to, you know, one of the local Mexicans and get me a, a Speedy Gonzalez? Right? I'm saying that because you're college students, you know what I'm talking about. Right? So again, this is monopolistic competition. Okay? So then, the only market power these companies can create, the only market power they can probably create is a, they can differentiate themselves and say, hey, I'm not like everybody else. My product is better. Right? My product is better. Uh, for example, we men mentioned Arborist. Aubrey has been able here in Cleveland to differentiate themselves that they are not just your typical restaurant. It's not the O'Charlie's. It's not the, you know, it's just a little bit better quality food, right? They have been able to differentiate themselves. So then they have some market power, but it's very, very, very small, right? In monopolistic competition, just like everybody else, they have a normal downward sloping curve. In the demand side, which simply means that if they want to sell more, they have to lower the price. And if they increase the price, people are going to buy less. And again, these companies make decisions without taking into consideration other companies. Right? They are independent decisions. They, 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 they don't care about what everybody else is this. They do. And there's very low barriers to entry. Very low barriers to entry. So then if they are very low profits to very low uh, barriers to entry, as soon as somebody see that somebody's making money in one of these establishments, what we know about profits, what we know is that profits is going to attract competition. So then what happened in the industry looks something like this, okay? Let me share the screen over here, okay? And this is what we have. Okay, so monopolistic competition, they have a normal demand curve, right? Which simply means um, that if they want to sell more, they have to lower the price. And if they do that, then simply means that the marginal revenue always separate. In monopolistic competition, 
just like everybody else, they have the strategy of trying to maximize profits. So they maximize profits by producing for marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Okay, for marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So this company is going to produce it right here. They're going to make a hundred dollars. I'm sorry, hundred units, and they're going to charge as much as you're willing to pay. You're willing to pay nineteen dollars for the product. They're going to charge you nineteen dollars. So now look at this situation of this company right here. Is this company making money or losing money? And right away, you know that this company is what? Is making money. So the company is charging $19 for the product and it's costing them 15 to make it. So the company is making $4 per unit times 100 units. So they're making uh, $400 in profits. But we already know something about profits. And what we know about profits is what? The profits will attract competition. Right? Profits is going to attract competition. So then what's going to happen as a result of the competition? Let's assume this is your restaurant. This is your restaurant. YR, your restaurant. Right? And your YR restaurant right, is profitable. Now, people are going to see that you're not very smart and you're driving a very expensive car. And they're going to see that you're not very smart and you live in a very fancy house. So right away, they know that you're making money in this industry. So then when people see somebody that owns a restaurant that is making money, somebody else is going to come into the industry, right? Now, when somebody comes into the industry, what's gonna to happen to your demand, to your restaurant? See, and somebody else opened another restaurant in the other side of town. What do people do when there's a new restaurant in town? Come on, you know, it's a new restaurant in town, what do we do? Demand shifts downward. Yeah, let's go, let's go try out that restaurant. Let's go ahead and try it, right? So now this restaurant begin to lose some customers. So then what happened, uh, hold on, I accidentally, uh, the system locked me. The system actually kicked me out, okay? Let me put you on hold for a second. Uh, buy new equipment, maybe find a way to reduce the amount of paper products you use or something. Uh, okay, so you'll, okay, what you will try to do, if you don't want to lose your profits, what you can do is try to reduce your average total cost of production. Fire the people that you have, right? Hire illegal aliens, right? Lower your cost of production. Or what else can you do? What else can you do? Think about this. You have monopolistic competition, you are a restaurant, you are making money, right and now a new restaurant open in town and some of your customers are running towards the new restaurant you still want to make money so the thing that you can do is you don't want to lose your customers you don't want them to be running to the other store so then what you can do you can probably try to do some promotions lower the price right so you lower the price and you hope that some of your customers will come back but if you lower your price what happened to your profits they're going to disappear. So it doesn't really matter. So then on the long run, a monopolistic competition is always going to operate at a point in which they're only going to be able to make a normal profit. In other words, we have too many restaurants. And now look at this, they're operating in some place right here. Remember the average total cost? You go all the way to right here, that's the lowest cost of production. See, as you can see, restaurants never operate at the most efficient point. They're always inefficient. Think about a town like Cleveland. If we have 40, res 40 restaurants, which is about right, you got 40 restaurants in town, okay? How many managers do we have? Probably 40 managers. What is the average salary that we pay into these restaurant managers? Let's say $50,000, right? Let's say $50,000. So 50 times, we're paying $2 million in salaries just on the manager itself. I mean, do we need 40 managers to manage the restaurant that we have in town? 
and the probability is, not, is probably no. We don't need 40 managers. Probably three or four guys will be able to run the whole operations of 40 restaurants. So what does that mean then? Well, what it means is that restaurants are very inefficient. They're very inefficient. They have too many people working. And they, even then, they're still not able to make a lot of money. Okay? So, let's continue. About monopolistic competition. Uh, profit margins are small. And the reason is because there's a lot of competitors and all of them offer a product that can be substitute for whatever you sell, okay? So then what companies will try to do, they will try to create some type of product differentiation. And by product differentiation simply means that what a company is going to try to do is try to create a situation in which they will make people believe, right? They'll make people believe that actually their product is actually better than the competition. Okay, so again, that's product differentiation, right? So then the goal of all these companies is to try to create an image in which consumers become loyal. In other words, there's like seven Mexican restaurants in town. I'm talking about me. There's about seven Mexican restaurants in town that I know, but there's only two that I go. There's only two that I go. For example, I had never gone to Monterey's. I stopped going to Monterey's probably six years ago. Why? Well, I don't see nothing unique about the restaurant, right? So I go to Last Mass, right? The one in Okoye, or I go to La Mass over there by Dunkin' Donuts. That's about the only two Mexican restaurants that I go. Why? Well, because to me, the food is a little bit better. So in my head, these restaurants have been able to create an image of which is worth it for me to go out of my way to go there. And that's about the only way these restaurants will be able to, different, to um, survive. So they create a brand loyalty. And now once they have a brand loyalty, they know that they're going to maintain their customers and you are not going to go try another place. You're not gonna go buy from the competition. And even if they increase the price a little bit, they know they're not going to lose customers because you know it's a good place. So then monopolistic competition, once they create a brand loyalty, they're going to have a higher repurchase rates, which simply means more people are going to continue buying from them. Right? And again, they will try to preserve their market share. Right? But the problem is that in order to maintain your loyal customers, the companies have to actually continuously try to expand services and offering. In other words, if you go to the restaurant and every time you go, they have the same things eventually you stop going. I think about myself in O'Charlies, right? I used to go to O'Charlies, and I used to go to O'Charlies not because it was the best food, but I used to go to O'Charlies because my son used to work there. You know, and more or less just to see him on, on Sundays, you know, be able to tip him, and just being able to see him. I used to go to O'Charlies every Sunday after church because my son used to work there, and I used to wait and ask for his table. After my son left, I continued going, and then I realized that I hate this food. I mean, it's like, they don't have nothing. They don't, I mean, again, I'm not saying nothing about, oh, Charlie, I'm talking about, for me. They don't have nothing. You know, the only thing that I used to ha like was a pasta. They can have a pasta with steak, a sirloin steak pasta, something like that. And I used to order that all the time. They took it out of the menu, and to me, well, they don't have nothing else. I go there and eat, what, burgers or the potato soup. That's about all, that's all they have going on for them. So then I don't go. Okay. So again, once you know that it's the same thing, people try, they have to try different things. You know, so because if you don't do that, your competition is going to do that. And think about, for example, what happened to crystals. I mean, how long has crystal been in business? I don't know, for many, many, many years. Crystals was not able to survive the coronavirus. I don't know if you know this. Crystals declared bankruptcy. And Crystals was just purchased by somebody else, by another investor. 
I don't know if it's wealthy individuals or another firm or something like that, and that these new investors are going to come back. And they just announced it yesterday in which they're going to try to rebrand the image. See, because Christos was good 40 years ago. When I was a student at Lee in 1979, which is exactly what, 40 years ago, 41 years ago? Yeah, 41 years ago, it was the only burger joint in town. And I remember going there at night times to study because they were open 24 hours. And Christos was a hangout place for college students. My generation, my generation, we used to go, you know, get a milkshake and eat a couple of Christos cheese and, you know, study there, 30 sessions. How many college students do you know they go for study sessions at Christos now? The only people that you see there is homeless people. You go at nighttime, these homeless people try to escape the, what, the winter outside. You know, sometimes they bring their, even their own cup and refill it. You know, and the people there, you know, they allow them to stay there because at least they have some companies and, you know, it's going to help them that nobody's going to come out and try to assault them, you know, at night, you know, rob them because there's customers. So in other words, their image has deteriorated, right? So now, hopefully, it's going to come back. By the way, I do like crystals. You know, I like crystals, but with so many options, you know, I don't have to go there, okay? Any questions or comments? So monopolistic composition, right? Again, they have to try to be competitors, competitive, and the only way they can be competitive is by trying to improve the product on the product. Okay. Uh, let's see. So monopolistic competition, they will use the strategy as we already discussed, where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. On this case, right here. So in our, is this company marginal cost equals marginal revenue? Is this company making money? And the answer is yes, because they can sell this product for PA and the cost of production is only CA. So all this orange square is actually the amount of profits the company is making. But what we know is this, that this company can only make profits on the short run. On the short run, because once profits appear, it's going to act like a beacon that demand for this store is going to decrease, which simply means profits are going to begin to disappear, or the company is going to try to continue keeping their customers, and they're going to have to spend more money on promotions and advertising and marketing, and the cost of production is going to go up. So how does a company like Chick-fil-A, for example, continue to offer the same product all the time? And Chick-fil-A is wildly successful. Uh, at this point, sir, at this point, with Chick-fil-A, is wow, okay, let, let me come back to this. Chick-fil-A is successfully, but only on, this part of the, only on this part of the United States. Because there's something unique. We associate Chick-fil-A with what? Come on, tell me. What is, what is Chick-fil-A? Jesus. Jesus. Christianity. Christianity. I mean, they're actually close, so you can go to church on Sunday. This is the Christian belt. I mean, I mean, what goes better than chicken, Christianity, and guns? <laughs> I was watching a movie yesterday. Which they, you know, there's a couple of guys traveling across the United States, you know, and they are robbers. You know, they come into some place in the South and say, hey, you have to be, be careful. He said, why? He said, I don't have to be careful. This is the Bible Belt. Come on, these people are Christians. They say, yeah, that's the problem. You know, this is the Bible Belt, and people have guns. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's the problem with uh, Chick-fil-A. Uh, Chick-fil-A has been good because they have a very good quality product, excellent service, right? And they have been able to create a brand image. And the brand image is, we are good guys. We don't care for, uh, for the lesbian community. We don't care for the gay community. We don't get care for this. We care about Bible, chicken, and church. So then us Christians, tend to patronize this restaurant at this point. So if you really think about it, there's also even a little bit of, of correlation between, you know, Chick-fil-A and the present political arena in which we are operating, the Trump administration. So does that mean that Chick-fil-A is going to continue being successful? Well, they'll be able to continue to be successful as long as they make some improvements on their menu. 
because eventually chicken nuggets are going to go out of style. Right? And, and, and it happened with all the restaurants. It happened with all the restaurants. Uh, I don't know if, well, you're too young to remember this, but when I was a young, young man like you, I mean, people used to go to W, what's the name of the restaurants? They used to sell uh, uh, root beer. A and W? BMW. What's it called? A and W? Yeah, A and W. I mean, that was the place, and people love it because they have, you know, root beer floats and root beer with Cokes, you know, Coke with ice cream. And it was the place to go. And then Sonic, right? Then McDonald's, then Wendy's, then Burger King. So it just happened that today is Chick-fil-A, Chick -fil you know, like the wheel, it's turn, the turn. Well, think about this, all the restaurants, all the fast food restaurants are going to that evolution, that evolution. Remember Papa John's at one time? Domino's, Godfather Pizza. Anybody remember Godfather Pizza? Okay, so it was before your time. It was Pizza Hut and then Godfather Pizza. My favorite pizza. Very successful chain. Went out of business because Papa John, then Uncle John, and then Mama John, and now Brother John, everybody selling pizza. So too much competition have killed the profits that these companies were actually making. Okay, any other comments? So the idea is, is what it's called, it's, it's called the wheel of retailing, an evolutionary process in which you become the king of the hill, right? And then you die. And then somebody else comes and then you die. Uh, we have uh, the dime stores, then we have Woolworths, then we have Sears, then we have JCPenney, then we have Neiman Marcus, and all the stores that I'm giving you are stores that at one time, they were at the highest. This was the stores, and now they are into bankruptcy, or they are disappearing, or they are no longer here. You don't remember the time, the time store. You don't know nothing about Woolworth, right? Do you know about dealers? Okay. Deal. Neiman Marcus is already going out of business. JC Penney declared bankruptcy. Remember Sears? Remember Kmart? Remember Kmart? Where are the Kmarts? The Kmart were the Walmarts of today. And Kmart was killed by Walmart. Right? And we have Walmart, and it was the king of the hill. And then Amazon came. And Amazon killed a lot of stores and even killing Walmart and Target. And now there's another store that is beginning to appear that is making some competition against uh, Amazon. What's the name of this company? Out of Asia. Alibaba. See? So we have two giants competing. It's just the wheel of retailing, how it actually works. Okay. In monopolistic competition, you cannot keep new players to come into the industry. So then, because we know that economic profits draw new competition, right? And when new players come into the industry, your profits are going to be squeezed, and eventually your profits are going to become zero. Right? So then on the long run, economic profits are always going to be zero, which simply means the company is only going to be able to make a normal profit. Again, the demand was someplace over here, the orange line, right? The company was making a lot of money, and then the demand began to decrease, 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 because now there's more competition in town. And as you can see now, this company, for marginal cost equals marginal revenue, charges as much as consumers are willing to pay. But now this company is only making a normal profit. Okay? So then the profits will be eliminated. So then what is the complaint that we have against monopolistic competition? They're inefficient. They never produce at the lowest average total cost of production. Right? Uh, I mean, they don't operate nothing close to perfect competition because perfect, perfect competition always operate at the lowest cost of production, right? And they always have more excess capacity than what we need. Think about, about this. Uh, when you go to a restaurant, well, probably not now, but in, even in the, in the past, when you used to go to the restaurant, in very few occasions, in very few occasions, in very few restaurants, 
the restaurant was at full capacity. Right? There's always a space. Right? And the reason was because they're inefficient. They are not able to actually determine the exact size of the restaurant to deal with the demand. And that's why we have a Starbucks in every corner. That's why we have 10 fast food out this, in this block. They're all small. So then there are more outlets than necessary to satisfy consumers' demand, which simply means there's all, always an excess capacity. How many, think about this, even in, in towns like Cleveland, how many sandwich places do we have? Subway, uh, what is it, Subway? Firehouse? Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Dean's? Can you think of anything else? How many firehouses do we have in town? We have two. How many uh, Subway sandwiches do we have in town? Three. How many Jim, Jimmy Dean's do we have? I know of two. So this, but that's nine sandwich places. Come on, how many people eat bread and bologna? That we need nine of them. Okay, again, inefficient. So then monopolistic competition results in both productive inefficiency and allocation inefficiency, which simply means they are never very efficient in production and they are never very good at the type of products they produce. So they have the wrong mix of output. Think about, for example, uh, think about, for example, in the burgers. In the burger situation, think about, for example, uh, here in town, we have, uh, what's the name of the burger place? Hardy's. Hardy's. Right? So Hardy's is a burger place. It actually, it's known for breakfast place, right? Go get breakfast in the morning. And now they're selling burgers. And now they're beginning to sell sandwiches. You know? And do you remember a couple of months ago, a couple of years ago, KFC decided to start selling tacos? Or Taco Bell decided to start selling burgers? Or pita, things like that. McDonald's decided to sell pizza. Do you know that? That McDonald's was selling pizza? It was called the Mac Pizza? You know, they try to introduce the products and it's just wrong. Think about how many, how many times has McDonald's introduced the, uh, what's it called, the, Mac, the McRib? <laughs> the new McRib. Let me tell you, the McRib is not new. It has been in business for about 50 years. It's such a bad meal. You know, they make it out of pork byproducts. They put it into patties and then they painted lines to make it look like it's actually a rib that has been grilled. You know that, right? It's actually, it's actually a patty made out of pork byproducts that has been colored red and it has black lines. When they take it out of the frozen, it's, it has the lines frozen like it's actually grilled and they just put it in the microwave and, and they give it to you. It's a bad product, right? And they have tried so many times and very few people, probably people like Nathaniel once in a while, they go out and try it. You know, but after they try two or three times, they say, okay, I'm not gonna eat it anymore. They take it out of, out of business and they come and introduce it. Think about, think about uh, Taco Bell. Tell me the type of things that they sell that have come in and come out. The uh, hot flaming Dorito tacos. The, uh, what's the name of the other one? The one that had one taco, the chalupa something. They had taquitos too. At the one point. the, the taquitos. Rolled the, tacos. Chiquitos. I don't even know. What else? Now they have. They just the, tried um, French fries. Oh, yeah. The, the cheese fries or the chicken fries. Right? Oh, that was KFC, you know, with the chicken fries. But think about Taco Bell. Remember, they have tried the fresco tacos at one time, then the hot, spicy tacos. Everything went red at one time. Probably that was before you became a, a, a young adult, but at one time, all the menu in Taco Bell was all spicy hot, right? And then now they introduce uh, something that looked like a little wrap. It's not, a, it's not a burrito, it's almost like a six stars, you know, like a chalupa, you know, which is nothing more than a burrito wrapped in a different way, right? And 
I think my my daughter just asked me to order her a Dorito Dorito Crunch Taco, which is a taco with a soft tortilla with a little uh, kind of a hot taco made out of Doritos. With you know, and the company is always trying new things, new things, new things, new things, and that's about the only way you'll be able to keep the people coming, right? And again, so then in conclusion to this chapter, all it's simply telling you is monopolistic competition is a very inefficient market that has a wrong product efficiency and also the wrong allocation efficiency, right? And these companies, the only way they can survive is by either having low prices, high promotions, or spending a lot of money on advertisement. It doesn't really matter what they do. On the long run, these companies are never going to be able to make more than a normal profit. And that's why when a restaurant opens its doors, they never expand. They open the doors for 50 people, and they're going to stay for 50 people for 100 years. Right? And when a company, a restaurant opened its doors or opened another restaurant in another place, it's not because of the profits they are making in another restaurant. It's because they are able to borrow money from the bank, and they're going to be able to put that money into operations. It's going to be enough to pay for the loan that they actually take in. And that's why, for example, what is happening today. Look at the news. How many chain of restaurants have actually gone under? And I'm not talking about humongous chain of restaurants. I'm talking about restaurants in which one entrepreneur has 10, 15 restaurants. These are the people that are going under. The guy that owns 10, 15 restaurants. In which they have not been able to make money for three months because the restaurant has been closed. And the only way they can make money is by what? By drive through. And some of these restaurants have no drive throughs So as a result of this, then hundreds of restaurants are actually going under because they were inefficient from the beginning. Okay. Any questions, guys? Okay, if there's no, no questions, then we have actually finished the class today. <laughs>